speaking before. Can you hear me at the back? Yes. Yes? Fire went around here, cover both ends. Um, I want to say a thank you, first of all. Thank you for having me today. Um, if there's anybody from the gay and lesbian community, a special thank you to, to you because you, uh, you performed absolutely sterling work during the dispute, supporting us on the demonstration. Um, not a great deal of people know about it, but believe me, it really, really was appreciated. So thank you very much. Hmm. It's very difficult to follow that last gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm certainly no Bob Crow, although we did support the same football team. No all done it. Um, lovely to see some of my colleagues from London, fellow workers, absolutely great. I'm going to make one apology. I've written a few notes down here just so that I don't forget. First thing I want to say the stories that were perpetrated by the Thatcher government and Murdoch were half truths at best. We weren't Luddites. We did embrace new technology. But believe me when I said, if they wanted to bring in new technology, we made them pay for it. If someone's going to lose their job, we made them pay for it. Lie two. All printers earn phenomenal money. Everybody in Fleet Street went home with their wages in wheelbarrows. <laughs> well, you tell that to some of the ladies who worked in Fleet Street. The clerical side, the cleaners. They earned a reasonable salary, but it wasn't anything phenomenal when you take into account the sort of profits that the organisations they actually work for were, were making. Lie three. Print workers wouldn't negotiate. We had agreements to go to Wapping. Not every chapel had its agreements. Some were still in negotiations, but we had agreements to go to Wapping. They were signed, they were sealed. All the antipathies that were between the NGA and the next SOPA in the machine area, which was where I was employed, they were deeply entrenched. We bridged them, we got together. We knew what was best and was going to be in our best interest. We signed the bits of paper to go. But these negotiations we were having were just smoke and mirrors. Because all the time, Murdoch, Thatcher were colluding. It was like they were coming to some Faustian agreement. You look after me, and I'll look after you. <clears throat> Murdoch wanted the Times and the Sunday Times, but the law of the land at that time said no. He turned around to Thatcher and said, if you can grease the wheels that will allow me to buy those titles, I will support you as a government, get you elected time after time. This was the agreement that he had. On top of that, as a tiller, the stockbroker made the point. Thatcher was carrying the bogey from 1972-73 when she was a junior education secretary and she saw her government, the Edward Heath government, thrown out. So she wanted a way to attack the unions. So she brought in the anti-union legislation that saw the pickets fighting with the police for jobs at Warrington, the miners' dispute, and whopping. This was purely and simply collusion at the highest levels of government. And unfortunately, it's still going on. All grief was mentioned just now. Hillsborough. Millie Dowler. <coughs> it goes on, it 
goes on, it goes on. Collusion at the highest level. The Leveson inquiry. What's happened? Absolutely nothing. Because it doesn't suit the proprietors. They want some voluntary code. Like the Press Complaints Commission. And everybody knows what a farce that turned out to be. Recently, we've had the junior doctors on picket line. Hopefully one or two of you here join them. I certainly did with my wife. What did you find in the sun? A picture of three young medical workers in India on a jolly. These underpaid doctors. They were out there doing charity work for the poor. So they were made to print a retraction in the sun. But the damage is already done. Because a lot of people just see guys like myself and other activists out there, here today, as just conspiracy theorists. But all you do, it doesn't take a lot of scratching at the surface to recognise what was going on with Greenpeace and how the covert police were cozying up with the women in Green, uh, at Greenham Common. There's duplicity at the highest level, comrades, ladies and gentlemen. People have got to be wary of it. People have got to believe that when legislation is passed, they are not acting in the best interests of the working classes. All they are acting in, interest, their interests are purely and utterly governed by that small clique at the very top who want to maintain their positions. An example of this, I'm digressing slightly, you've got Cameron diving over to Europe, threatening an in-out referendum. And one of the things he wants is a change in the European law and, the, uh, and to increase the powers of the anti-union legislation. They are still at it. They are still attacking us. <clears throat> I want to talk about how the dispute actually impacts on families. 6,000 of us lost our jobs. We never came out on strike, funny enough. Everybody calls it printer strike. We were locked out. We never went out on strike. It was purely, I was on holiday. The next thing I know, I've got a letter saying I'm sacked. So we were locked out. Now, 6,000 of us, men and women, if you work on the average that for every person who lost their job, that they're in a family and there's at least three more, that's 24, 25,000 people that's being impacted by this dispute. And what is the effect on those families when the principal breadwinners lost their jobs? Well, everybody's got their story, and I've certainly got mine. I had a dear young friend, married, nice house, two children. His wife left him, they foreclosed on his house, and he was found hanging in the garage. This is what happens. Don't, if, you don't like what I'm, if you don't believe what I'm saying, read some of the, what's been written about the miners' dispute. This is what happens. I had friends driven to drink and drugs through depression. They're not with me now. Personal level, it brought on a heart condition, which I'm living with now. That's why people say, it's 30 years, get over it. How? I'm living with it every single day. Yes. Where are we now? Well, things media-wise, haven't got any better. Yes, people might be going to their little tablets and their iPads and mobile telephone thingies. I'm not really up for this new text week. But the same perpetrators <coughs> of the half truths and lies are still there. Yes, circulations of newspapers have gone down significantly. But for every newspaper that is printed, 
four people on average reading. So when you think about it, that is an awful big readership, albeit not a lot of people are paying for it. But some of those lies are still getting out there. My mother in law, God bless her, she was so left wing it was unbelievable. And yet she couldn't do it without a daily mail. I really, it, I find it absolutely phenomenal. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's insidious the way these proprietors, these titles, they, 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 they get into the system. Always made me scratch my head. Never could understand it. So, what have we got now? I've digressed once again. I do it quite a lot. You ask my wife. We stopped Murdoch doing what he wanted to do by going on strike. We never put what in dispute. We never got what we wanted. But we stopped him from getting what he wanted, which was Sky. Mm -hmm. He got in there, but he wanted the lot. We cost him millions and millions and millions and millions. The unfortunate side of it is, obviously, it's not a lot of science, he's making a lot of money again. He's got Fox in America. Sky News over here furnishes ITV News. The slant is always going to be the same. Fox tells lies to the extent it's almost laughable. Do you remember they talked about the no-go zones for police in Stepney and Birmingham? ATV, ITV, call it what you like. Their slants much the same. And much more of a concern to me, ladies and gentlemen, comrades, is what's happening at the BBC. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody who watched the Daily Politics show, who saw Kunberg um, introduce the Labour minister who was going to resign. This is gutter politics. It's real gutter politics. The only thing that really doesn't surprise me is that the editor of the show is one of Murdoch's henchmen, Andrew Neil, former former senior reporter on the Sunday Times. Time. So the BBC is running scared, comrades. People have really got to be aware. They've got to read between the lines. They can't be trusted. They really can't be trusted. Attila, the stockbroker, talked about Corbyn. Now, I didn't vote for Corbyn when he came up for re-election, the leader of the Labour Party. I voted him as number two. During the dispute, this is the relevance of it, Chair. During the dispute, Blair, Brown, Mandelson, Campbell, and all the other Alicadoos, they were happily talking to the Times and the Sunday Times and the Sun. But I'll tell you what, comrades, I know where Corby was, I know where Skinner was, I know where Heffer was, I know where Tony Banks was. And they were with us on the picket line. So that man, for my, my position, has got my utmost respect. I don't necessarily agree with him, he says. But at least I know where that man stands. And I think everybody should appreciate that whilst you might not accept everything he says, the man is a man of principle and a great philosopher, in my opinion. I'd like to leave you with one more thing, if I may, Chair. And ironically, I printed it this morning. And it dates from 1915. So it's 100 years this year. It's called Ode to a Scab by Jack London. Colleagues, after God had finished the rattlesnake, the toad and the vampire, he had some awful substance left with which he made the scab. A scab is a two-legged animal with a corkscrew sole and a water of brain and a combina combination of backbone made of jelly and glue. Where others have hearts, he carries a tumour of rotten principles. When a scab comes down the street, 
Men turn their backs and angels weep in heaven. And the devil shuts the gates of hell to keep him out. No man has a right to scab as long as there is a pool of water deep enough to drown his body in. Or a rope long enough to hang his carcass with. Judas Iscariot was a gentleman compared with the scab for betraying his master. He had the character enough to hang himself. A scab hasn't. Esau sold his birthright for a mess of potage. Judas Iscariot sold his saviour for 30 pieces of silver. And Benedict Arnold sold his country for a promise of a commission in the British Army. The modern strikebreaker sells his birthright, his country, his wife, his children and his fellow men for an unfulfilled promise from his employer, trust or corporation. That sums up what happened to us at Wapping. My attitude to people who crossed my picket line. My attitude to people who thought Eric Hammond, that great pariah within the TUC, who thought he was a good man. 30 years old, the Wapping dispute this weekend. I will take the Wapping dispute to my grave. And I think hopefully people will remember the disputes that we spoke about earlier, the miners' dispute and the whopping dispute, for as long as I'm going to remember it. Thank you very much, comrades.